Citric acid. Black mold. Citric acid. Black mold. Citric acid. Black mold. What up, y'all? It's Kim Thug. And today, we talk about the active ingredient in citrus fruit. That's right. I'm talking about citric acid, which way more interesting of a molecule than I ever expected it to be. So for one, it was discovered twice, which to me, that's just like fascinating. It's that whole lost knowledge thing. It's also central to virtually all life, like all oxygen dependent life uses citric acid in some way, which to me is also one of those things where I'm like, I knew this, but I didn't know it. And being reminded of it even is just like, that's wild. If we wanted to cover the 2.7 million tons of it we made in 2023, we would need 50 billion extra lemons. And that's part of why for the last hundred years or so, we've been making it from mold. The same way that we make like alcohol and acetic acid vinegar from a fungus, but we are gonna talk about it. First though, I wanna talk about how it was initially discovered, cause that to me is kind of cool. This Persian alchemist by the name of Jabir Ibn Hayyan isolated a substance whose properties track to what we know now to be citric acid. Side note, this guy Jabir also in discovered hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, tartaric acid, and a few other chemi chemical techniques discovered, developed, perfected. He's a very interesting character. Definitely gonna get his own video. I digress. The substance he was able to describe the properties of matches up with what we know of as citric acid today. But at the time, we just didn't really know enough about chemistry as like a hard science. As I said, he was an alchemist. So the information about citric acid just kind of ended up not getting used for almost an exact thousand years. Because in 1794, the German Swedish chemist, Carl Wilhelm Scheele was able to also isolate citric acid from lemon juice, but he did so in a pure form. At this point, we kind of knew a little bit more about chemistry. We had a better understanding of, well, I can take a molecule and turn it into something else. So once the chemist had like the active ingredient of citrus fruit, you know, the essence of lemon, it was like, well, what can we do with it? And more importantly, how do we get more of it? So the first part, what can we do with it, is rather fascinating. Citric acid as a molecule kind of looks like if you took two acetic acid molecules, a methanol molecule, and a formic acid molecule and just have all of them hold hands in the middle. And because it's got these three different acid parts on it, it's what's called a tricarboxylic acid. Having three of those makes it pretty strong. It's about a hundred times stronger than vinegar as far as acids go, but it's still safe to eat. So while it's very good at doing most of the things that vinegar can do in terms of cleaning and cooking, it's kind of got its own special uses as well. One of the really special things about citric acid is again, the fact that it's got three of those carboxylic acids on it. Because those three groups, if they all lose their proton, well, all three of them can attach to metal ions. And if you get two citrate molecules, they'll both attach to a metal ion, and then that metal ion can't do anything else. And this is called chelation. And this chelating property, this ability to sequester metals and make them not do chemistry is a big part of what citric acid even got used for early on. So with all of these uses and more, like it gets used in dyes as a mordant, it gets it gets used in metal in metalworking because it can passivate the surfaces of metals, which is a process where you make a coating on the metal so that it doesn't react with things as much. A good example of this is aluminum foil, which Aluminum foil is way more reactive than you think. Maybe I'll make a little video about it. But citric acid is a very useful molecule, incredibly useful in terms of the things that can be done with it. And so the next thing that chemists wanted to do was figure out, well, how can we make it? And unfortunately, making it in the lab, not a vibe. The best synthesis that was developed for citric acid was developed by this gentleman, Louis Grimau, and his colleague, Adams, whose first name I can't find. But their synthesis starts from glycerol, the stuff you get when you saponify soap, and requires potassium dichromate and cyanide in two steps. I, you don't want none of that near anything you're gonna eat. Like, nah, like, no. So it was really great that in 1893, Carl Weimer, a German chemist and mycologist, cause this was still the time when like, scientists were just scientists. So, you know, he's a chemist, but he's also working with fungi. Fortunately, 
he was a chemist and working with fungi and figured out while working with this fungi, hey, yo, this fungi is making like a lot more citric acid than I feel like it's supposed to. I wonder if I can use this fungi to make citric acid in large quantities. And it turns out he was right. So a few years later, he managed to get a patent for doing this in an industrial scale. And it kind of failed. And the Italian citrus fruit industry rejoiced for another few years because up until that point, that was where all the citric acid came from. But Waymer's method, while in principle made sense, didn't work that well, mostly because they couldn't get a pure product. <laughs> the citric acid was too contaminated to use. So that idea got scrapped for maybe about 20 years until John Curie, a food chemist in the US was like, wait, what if I use Aspergillus niger though? Yes, yes, this is one of the ones, the black mold thing, we're gonna get to it. So 1915 kind of marked the start of us brewing one of our newest industrial chemical products, citric acid. Making citric acid from Aspergillus niger has been something we've been doing for over a hundred years at this point. And we've been really refining this process that whole time. What's really fascinating to me though, is part of why you can make citric acid from Aspergillus niger, because it's not the only one you can make it from. Remember, Waymer figured out making it from the penicillin mold, which I think is still the same one that we use to make actual penicillin. But it's in part because citric acid occurs not just in citrus fruit, but in you too, and your dog, and your mom, and everybody else you know, and everything you know. Citric acid is central to this thing called the citric acid cycle, which is the same thing as the Krebs cycle. What? <laughs> Which if you didn't know, and I'm not a biochemist, so I'm gonna skim through this a little bit. When you eat food, your body has to break that food down into stuff to make energy out of that food. The cycle in your body that turns your food into energy is the Krebs cycle. <laughs> The citric acid cycle is responsible for you having any energy to watch this video right now. That blows my mind. Like what, why, why? It has a lot to do with the chemistry of the citric acid molecule. And that's a lot to get into in this video. So I will spare you that one, but perhaps let me know in the comments if you want like a deep dive on the Krebs cycle. In some ways, this is part of why and how we're able to use a microorganism to make citric acid. You can kind of hack their metabolism and if you feed them a specific broth of ingredients, then they're gonna overproduce citric acid and then you can just collect the citric acid. There are a couple different ways that the setup for brewing citric acid works, but generally speaking, you take a solution of, we'll call them waste sugars, just like sugary liquids, molasses, corn syrup, that's not good for people. People aren't gonna eat this stuff and you mix it with the mold and the mold is usually like kind of just in the solution and you kind of just agitate it and you let it go and you let it cook for a little while. But eventually the Aspergillus niger mold will turn that sugar solution that you gave it into citric acid and some other things, but mostly citric acid. Kind of the same way that, you know, yeast turns sugar into beer and how a mother of vinegar turns ethanol into acetic acid. So the mold does the same thing. Once you have all this citric acid created from the sugar you gave it though, you gotta get it out. So the first thing they do is, well, you know, you filter out the mold because you don't want the mold. You got this liquid now that doesn't have the mold in it anymore. And what they do with this liquid, which is full of citric acid and other things, is they add this stuff called calcium hydroxide or lime to the mixture. If you garden, you're probably familiar with calcium hydroxide. It's often used as a base to raise the pH of your soil. And here it acts as a base to react with the citric acid specifically all three of those carboxylic acids on it. It pops those protons off and the, cal the calcium hydroxide turns into water and just free calcium ions. The citric acid, having been deprotonated, becomes a citrate anion and it pairs up with the calcium. And now you've got calcium citrate and that does not dissolve in water. Calcium hydroxide will, and so does citric acid, but because the calcium citrate doesn't dissolve, once you mix these two things together, it just kind of falls out of solution. It's almost magical, actually. It's like you mix two clear solutions and you just get sand. But this sand is relatively pure calcium citrate. So now that you got your kind of calcium citrate powder here, you kind of, you got to clean it up a little bit more. So they effectively put it in a washing machine because this powder doesn't dissolve in water, but anything that's like mixed in with it probably does. And once you've got pure calcium citrate, now it's time for the next step. 
You take that powder and you mix it with this magical, magical, magical substance called sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is a wild chemical. Like, it is so important to humanity. It is kind of ridiculous how important sulfuric acid is to humanity. Definitely gonna get its own video. One of the things that most people know about sulfuric acid, though, is that it's a very aggressive, angry, powerful acid. And not a lot of things are gonna do a good job of surviving once exposed to it. Granted, they probably don't use purely concentrated sulfuric acid. I do believe it's dilute sulfuric acid, but still. Once you've got your washed calcium citrate and you add that sulfuric acid to it, you get another acid-base reaction. And this time, the calcium citrate reacts and turns back into citric acid, and the calcium and the sulfate from the sulfuric acid pair up to make calcium sulfate, which that isn't soluble in water, so that just falls out. But the citric acid you just made is soluble in water, so that stays there. Incidentally, that calcium sulfate stuff is effectively the same stuff that's in drywall. It's like gypsum. So it's very not water soluble. So you just kind of filter it out the same way you'd like filter, you know, coffee grinds. And you're left with a liquid that's very concentrated in citric acid. So now how do you get the citric acid out? There are a couple ways. Usually they recrystallize the citric acid out. And if you want to know about recrystallization, you should check out my video on recrystallization, specifically the one about the borax skull. I did a good job on that video. It's a very good explanation. Go check it out. Long story short, most things, when you dissolve them in a liquid, in this case, citric acid and water, there's like a limit to how much you can get into that amount of water that you have. And you can increase that limit by heating the water up, but you also decrease the limit if you cool the water down, right? Because one thing has to be true, then the other thing has to be true, right? So once you've got this solution of citric acid, after reacting it with the sulfuric acid and filtering out the calcium sulfate, what they can do is just try to dry up the water and just get the citric acid by itself. Because if you if you have less water, you can't you can't dissolve as much citric acid. So it just starts to literally just come out as a solid. The other thing you can do is cool this water down. Same principle, where as you're cooling it down, the water can't hold on to as much citric acid anymore. So citric acid starts to just kind of group and clump together in the solution. And this is where the crystals come from. In order to do this, each of those citric acid molecules kind of have to come together and hold hands in the right orientation. And if they can't, then they don't form a crystal. But more importantly, if something else tries to get in there and form the crystal, it won't work either. It has to be the citric acid molecule or whatever else you're recrystallizing. Recrystallization is itself a process of purifying things, and this is how they get pure citric acid after the fact. At the end of this process, you end up with pure crystals of that sticky, icky, ooey gooey citric acid good stuff. This pure citric acid that you get at the end of this process should be pretty much good for more or less any purpose. Asterisk because we do have to talk a little bit about the fact that some people feel some type of way about the fact that we make it from a fungus. Some people might not like the fact that I said fungus instead of mold. It's a kind of an important distinction. Not all funguses form molds. Probably most molds are funguses, but not all funguses form molds. And to call it a mold is not really meaningfully useful or helpful, I think, in that discussion. The other important thing to understand is that Aspergillus niger the fungus used to make citric acid isn't the same as stachybotrys, which is the commonly thought of bad black mold. And we don't use that one to make citric acid. But Aspergillus niger is one of those molds that's like literally everywhere. I don't care how clean you think your house is. There is Aspergillus niger in your house and it's okay. It's more or less fine. I am not the only one who's ever gotten an onion out of the cabinet and been like, yo, there's a little bit of black stuff on it. You know, I'm gonna rinse this off. For the vast majority of people, that fungus does not cause any form of adverse reaction. And we have a hundred years of making citric acid in this way to kind of show that the vast majority of people are not negatively impacted by citric acid that's made in this fashion. However, it is understood there is a small percentage of the strains of Aspergillus niger that are capable of, pro of producing a mycotoxin called okratoxin A. Now, I said all of that and I know somebody's freaking out. 
It is not that kind of harmful. It is mostly a problem for specific people who have a specific sensitivity to it. I'm not gonna sit here and say that maybe it wouldn't be nice to get a label on things that say this citric acid was made via Aspergillus niger, but the reality is almost all of our citric acid is made from Aspergillus niger. That said, however, the overwhelming majority of evidence dictates that it is not a problem for people. That isn't to say that people aren't looking into better ways to make sure that more people are not impacted by any slight adverse effect from, you know, poor purification. And there is a lot to be said about the actual manufacturer and what processes they follow versus the idealized situation. But at the end of the day, like unless they are giving you that broth from the beginning, it really shouldn't be that bad. Although that broth in the beginning, yeah, you know, like you don't, you don't, you, you, you don't, I, I cut that part off the onion. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to say, you know, eat fungus. Like don't, don't do that. <laughs> but yeah, citric acid, yet another one of those wonderful commodity chemicals that we can brew. And boy, do we brew a lot of it because there are just too many things that it's good for. I, I didn't even get into like, the fact that a lot of supplements are made as citrate supplements because, well, as I mentioned, it's kind of part of that whole Krebs cycle thing. So, you know, if there's anything that's going to be safe for your body, it's probably citric acid. Yeah, it's just it's just a dope little molecule. It really is. And I'm glad I made this video and I'm glad you watched to the end. And I thank you so, so very, very much for your attention and your time. I really hope you enjoyed this one. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you learned something as for always. If you did, definitely appreciate it if you hit that like button. If you really like my stuff, definitely appreciate it. If you follow me on Patreon or hit me up on Ko-fi, follow up questions as always, throw them in the comments. Until next time, Skim Thug.